Our scripture reading this morning will be from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to verse 28. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody today. I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that we get the opportunity to worship together and to study together today. If you're a guest with us, as has already been mentioned, we're particularly glad that you've joined us today, and... Um, and we hope that our time together is a blessing to you in your walk with Christ. We have 214 people here this morning, and we're grateful to God for every single one of you. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope, and I imagine, as you were coming in, that you got a family report. Uh, that's our weekly bulletin. On the back page of that, there's a place to take notes along with this message. And if you didn't get one of those and you want one, you can raise your hand. And there's two guys in the back of the room that will be more than happy to bring you that. And as I say, there is an outline on the back page of that. As you look through that today, you may have noticed that both sermon places have the same title. That's on purpose. We are going to do part one this morning and part two this evening. And so that's not a, in spite of my track record up to this point, that's not a typo. That's not a mistake. Um, <laughs> and uh, so if you want to make your plans to be here for that sermon, uh, for the second part, rather, of this sermon, uh, then we would invite you to do that. But either way, we're glad that you're with us this morning, and I hope that it is a blessing to you in your spiritual life. Has anybody ever been inside one of those hedge mazes, like a legitimate one? I'm not talking about a corn maze. That totally doesn't count. You can find those everywhere this time of year, but it's not the same thing because you can see all the way through a corn maze. I'm talking about a hedge maze, one of those things where you're down inside it. You can't see over it. You can't see through it. You can't run through it. You just have to work your way around the maze. Has anybody ever been in one of these legitimate ones? No, I didn't think, okay, one person in the entire room has been into one of these things. Apparently, they're harder to find in the U.S. than they are in the U.K., but here's what I've noticed about these. Here's what I've noticed about these. I think they must freak a lot of us out because I can think of several movies where this plays a major role in adding to the suspense of the whole movie right? It's the Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. She gets stuck in the maze and can't find her way out and the Queen of Hearts is chasing her. It's all of that kind of thing. I've seen commercials that demonstrate how this particular company can get you to a stress-free life by getting you out of the maze that, you know, has you entrapped in some way. And all of those tell me that this whole idea of being stuck in a maze must be something that all of us find kind of tough to grapple with. Otherwise, we wouldn't all be drawn so much to the idea of getting out of one of these mazes. So my question is today, what if your marriage is like that? What if your marriage, if in your marriage you feel like you're guessing at each intersection and each interaction? Well, you know, I don't know, maybe this will take me somewhere good, maybe it won't. I really have no idea where we're going in this. And what if when you think about your marriage, you feel like you're pretty deep into something that is too substantial to see through or to see over, and you're just wondering, where do we really go with this? I have no clue how to figure this out. Or what if when you think about your marriage, that's the way you picture it, and your one thought is, how do I get out? Well, today, I want to do my best to talk you out of not wanting at least that last one to get out. And because for faithful people, there really is no good way to get out once you're committed to a marriage. And so what I want to do with today's message, what I want to do with today's message is show you some ways that we can navigate the maze of marriage in peace. Not that we can get out of it and find peace somewhere else, but that we can navigate this maze 
in peace. And I just want to remind us of some biblical principles that will help us, I think. Every time that you and your spouse come to an intersection in this maze and you wonder, which way do we go? Where is this one going to take us? That when we hit those various intersections or we have to make a decision about what to do next, I want to show you some biblical principles that will help you not to have to guess at whether this way or that way will lead you to something good. I want to give you a little bit today of a road map that will help you to navigate. And my hope is that you can find a, a way to navigate your marriage with your spouse in a way that it leads you both to where you really want to go, which is a place where you can experience God's blessings and his joy and fulfillment. So that's what I want to do. I want to talk about how to navigate the marriage maze a little bit this morning. And by the way, if you've been sitting there trying to figure out your way through that maze, quit. I need you, all right? <laughs> all right. So let me give you five things to think about quickly this morning. And these are kind of generic principles, okay? These are the principles that can help us to work our way through the maze. Tonight we're going to talk about dealing with specific applications of that. But let me set down for this morning five principles that will help us to navigate this. The first thing we need to do, and I've kind of already mentioned this, is we need to make sure that we adjust our outlook on the whole maze idea. I think it is tempting sometimes, especially when things are difficult in a marriage, to look at the relationship and go, how do I get out of this? How do I get past this? When do we get to quit navigating the maze? Now, I'm talking to people who know the Bible well, and so you know that the Bible's view of marriage is that it is a permanent thing and it is an exclusive thing. And so we find passages like this in our, in our Bibles, that Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man separate. I do think there's a bit of emphasis behind that. I don't think he's saying, and you know, try your best not to separate. No, I think he's giving an absolute command there. Let not man separate what God has joined together in a marriage. And then the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when he's talking about marriage, he says, to the married I give this charge that the wife should not separate from her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife. The point of both of those is that marriage is meant to be a permanent and exclusive thing. There is a strong biblical mandate for us to stay faithful to our spouses. There are strong biblical warnings against divorce and against adultery that are all through the law and the prophets. They're all through uh, the Torah. They're all through the New Testament. And the strength is only increased in those admonitions as you go through the Bible. And so let's just go ahead and make sure right here on the front end that as we're shifting our perspective here, that what we're doing is understanding we are not looking for a way out. If you're in the marriage maze, you're in it for the long haul. I'm not even going to encourage you to, to, to think about, well, maybe what if we get to the end of this thing? No, this is where we live now. This is how it is. And so what we want to do is rather, rather than saying, how do we get out of this or how do we get away from this? What we, and actually, before I even move on from that, let's add this one. Rather than resigning ourselves to, well, I guess I'm stuck, okay? Again, in a technical sense, that is kind of true. That's the biblical mandate there. But I don't think that sense of resignation is very helpful. That mindset is just not going to get us very well. I mean, how many relationships can you think of that are going to thrive on feelings of bitterness or resentment or apathy, which is what that is? How many relationships are going to thrive on that? And the answer is absolutely none. And so what's the better way to think? What's the better way to look at it? Well, from either of those, can I encourage you, can we change our focus from how do I make this different or what can happen for me to ask the question, how can we make the most of where we are? How can we make this good? Now, number one, in the way that I had you fill that in in the study guide, that, that takes the focus off of me, doesn't it? Right? That's a healthy thing. It takes the focus off of me, and it puts the focus on us. And really, that's how it needs to work. If you want to write down two passages here to indicate that idea and to show you that that's what's going on, let's remind ourselves that in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord said, the two shall become one flesh. The focus is not on either one. Now the focus is on the two that have become one. And so that's Genesis chapter 2. You might also fill in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6 on that. But the second passage comes from, again, that same context that we read just a minute ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is verses 32 to 35. 
The apostle says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But here you go, verse 33, the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. And then a little farther down the page, the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I know that Paul's dealing with a very specific context in that situation right there, very specific situation in that context. But the little statements that he makes right there are just confronting a reality that's always present, which is when you're married, what are you worried about? Well, you worry about your spouse, don't you? You're concerned about them. You're, they, they take some of the focus that you have in your life. And you should be concerned with what's good for your spouse. And so rather than saying, how do I get out of this? So I guess I'm stuck. Let's ask ourselves, how do we make the most of this? Because that's a perspective that offers hope where the other two just do not. And that's what I want you to see in this first point. If we spend our time thinking about how to get out of this maze that can be so difficult at times, then we're only going to find frustration. But if we're focused on making the most of where we are for both spouses, then letting the two become one entity in the way that God designed it is going to be very healthy for both of us. And so what does it take then to make that happen? You change your mindset. What does it take to make that happen and to, to have a more positive mindset? Well, the first thing is it depends on doing things God's way. And I know that that sounds just almost painfully obvious here, but I just want to encourage you because sometimes I lose sight of this and I know that there must be others who do as well. I just want to encourage you to make sure that Bible study and prayer are an important part of your married life. Again, how obvious is that to say in a sermon about marriage? I understand it's that obvious, but because it's so obvious, somehow we all seem to forget about it at times. And so make sure that God's way of living is how you live toward your spouse. Can I give a little bit of specificity to that in saying it this way? That the rules for Christian living do not change in your relationship to your spouse. They only become, in fact, more important. And so all the biblical guidelines about living generously, about being a servant to other people, about speaking with kindness in your words, telling the truth, resolving conflict with grace, the, the biblical ideas about keeping your commitments and praying for other people and returning good for evil rather than evil for evil, all of those kind of ideas about Christian living, you know where those ought to be applied first in your life? At home. You don't get to say, well, that's how I'm supposed to live as a Christian and so it's a good thing I have a relationship where that's not required of me as much. No. No. No, not at all. That's not at all going to be true of your marriage. The first person in your life who should receive all of the blessings of your Christian living is your spouse. Now, living like that takes faith. It takes more faith in God than in yourself or in your spouse. This is the kind of thing that's got to be a matter of discipleship deep in your heart. Are you going to be perfect at it? No, of course not. But if you try... And you set a pattern that shows you are trying to live as a Christian in every way, especially toward your spouse, then that's a pattern that will bless you both. Now, I'm going to make a fair warning here. I'm going to make a fair warning, and it might not seem like this warning needs to be made because this, again, is the obvious point. We need to do things the way God tells us to do. But the warning that I want to make is at various intersections in the marriage maze, you're going to have to go against your own intuitions to do things the way that God asks you to do. And at some points in the marriage maze, you're going to have to even go against the advice that you have been given to do things the way that God wants you to do them. I remember hearing the comedian Jeff Foxworthy tell a story about the moment he realized something in his marriage. He said, I was sitting in bed reading, and my wife was sitting in bed right, reading right next to me, and all she did was go it's hot. And he said, I put my book down and I got up, I walked all the way across the bedroom. I turned the fan on, came back to the bed. And as I was climbing in bed, I went, whoa, 
I didn't know I was supposed to do that. (laughs) And he said, I realized in that moment that she had been training me. And he said, I knew, I knew that she was on her, on the phone to her mama the next morning going, mama, it is working. (laughs) Now, I, that's innocent enough. Okay, that's fine. But can we, can we notice something about that little scenario right there, as cute and funny as it is? That that innocent jo- joke is next door to marriage advice that sounds like this. That tells women, you know, you are going to have to train him. You're going to have to fix him. You're going to have to be the leader in your home. You're going to have to correct his issues because men, they just have no clue about how marriage and family is supposed to work. And so if you have to trick him, if you have to manipulate him, if you have to withhold sex from him to get him to do what you need to do, that's okay because you're going to have to make him better, honey. Does that sound biblical to you? No. And on the other side of the coin, when men are told to be tyrants of their houses or to be titans in their workplace who are always gone because it's, you know, the kids don't need me. It's It's the woman's, my wife's job to manage home and family. Does that sound biblical to you? No, but you know what? Advice gets given on both sides of that coin in that way, doesn't it? And neither one of those is right. And so that's what I'm saying to you is that I know this point sounds very simple, that in your marriage you need to always go God's way, but I'm telling you that there are going to be times when doing that is going to require you to go against the grain of some of the advice that you've been given. And it's also going to require you to go against some of the intuitions that you're going to have. If God's way for your marriage says to go a different ways, a different way in the maze than you feel like you should go, if it goes a different way than you've been told to go, then you still need to follow His way. The most complete summary statement on marriage in the whole of the Bible, at least as far as I'm concerned, has a piece of advice for husbands and for wives, and they both sound like it's not going to work sometimes. This is Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, I hear that, Lord, but what about the times when a husband thinks, I can't love her, not if she's going to be like that. Nope. You've got to go against your intuitions and follow in faith and show her the love that Jesus has for his church. Okay, Lord, I hear that verse, but what about, what about when the wife thinks, I, I, I get it, Lord, but I just can't respect him. He hasn't done anything to earn my respect. Nope. Go against your intuitions. Follow your faith and show the man the respect that the church ought to show to Christ. And again, I know that all of this sounds simple enough to say that we should follow our faith and follow God's way through the marriage maze. But please don't think that this is a throwaway point just because it's obvious. This can be hard. But if we're going to find peace in this way of living, in the married life, then we better make this the top priority. And maybe one of the biggest components of that kind of thing is the next point here. The next big idea in living as God has asked you to live in the maze Maybe the, one of the biggest components of that is this, to navigate by the golden rule. You remember that, right? The commandment that Jesus gave, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's one of those things from the Bible that sounds great to everybody. Like even if people don't like the Bible, they don't like Jesus, they don't like Christianity, they don't like any of it, they like that idea, right? Whatever you want people to do to you, do that for them. It sounds like it balances the whole equation of humanity just perfectly. But it still comes with challenges. And the challenges in that commandment come down to two things that I think we're all... I assume anyway. I know I'm tempted by these two challenges, and I assume that we all probably are at some level or another. First, we kind of wish that this command would say, whatever you want people to do for you, that's what they should do. (laughs) Right? (laughs) We kind of all wish that that's that's what it said, that it should be directed toward other people. And so whatever I wish that all 213 of you would do for me, that's what I'm going to tell you to do for me. But it doesn't work like that because this commandment is directed at one person and that's me. This commandment is for each one and that's an especially relevant commandment for marriage. You have a responsibility 
to be good for and to be good to your spouse. Your responsibility is not to set the expectations for them of how they should be good for you. It's to set expectations for your own selfless behavior toward them. You've got something to give. Everybody does. God literally made us for each other, men and women. And so we have something to give, and that means that we should be willing to give. But the second challenge that I want to point out here, and this is a very subtle one, but it is an important thing to think about here. When I was studying for this message, I realized that in my head, there's always kind of been an ellipsis at the end of what Jesus says right there, right? That whatever you wish that people would do to you, do also to them, dot, 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 and then they will learn to do that for you. (laughs) Is that what that passage says? No. In fact, Jesus is not at all concerned in that whole context about whether this will be returned towards you. That's what I was thinking for the longest time, is that if Jesus said that, whatever you want them to do, you do that for them and they will eventually return it. But that's not what he says. And now that's a subtle, subliminal kind of thing there. And I never realized how much I was doing that until I suddenly became aware of it in prep for this message. And then I realized how often I have been guilty of thinking like that. Again, maybe I'm the only one, but I doubt it. And that's not really what Jesus is saying here anyway, is it? Because who's he talking about? He's talking about me. Just what I will do for others. Not about what I can expect from that, but what I should expect of myself to do for others. And that fits well with what Jesus says in another passage. I hesitate to even bring this passage up, but I'll show you why in just a second here. But this is from from Luke chapter 6. From Luke chapter 6, this is verse 35. He says, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. It's a little risky, and this is why I was hesitant. It's a little risky to bring up a passage about loving your enemies in a sermon on marriage. (laughs) Okay. You pass that point, though. When When we look at this passage, he says, Lend, expecting nothing in return. If he expects that behavior of us in regard to our enemies, how much more should he, would, he, would he be justified in expecting that behavior toward our spouses? And so that's what, that's what it means here. What, what that means is that if we are going to navigate this maze well, then we need to get it in our minds that we will be generous, we will give, we will be servants for our spouses. There are inevitably going to be times in a relationship when you have to take from the relationship. Those times always come, and I understand that. But what I'm encouraging you with this morning is to make sure that that's not the rule. Make that the exception. That when you have to necessarily take from the, sp- from, from the relationship in some way, you have to make a withdrawal from that bank account, make sure that it's a rare thing. Because you've spent so much more of your time giving and being a blessing to your spouse. And so can I just encourage you to think honestly about your marriage and to ask and answer some of these, to ask and answer this one question, basically. What can I give to my spouse? What do they need from me that I can give them? Now maybe there, let me give you some options to think about here, some things that you may need to give to your spouse. Maybe what they need from you is forgiveness. Maybe what your spouse needs from you is just a little bit of that sense of humor that the Lord blessed you with. Maybe what your spouse needs from you is that you believe in them, you have some faith in them. Maybe they just need your time. Maybe they just need a few more kind words than the ones you've been speaking recently. Maybe what your spouse needs from you is a clean house and you can give that as a gift or a repaired leaky faucet. Maybe your spouse needs financial peace or some optimism in their life or some joy or just make them some food. Maybe they need some sort of special experience or some words of thankfulness, uh, something just said purely for the sake of being kind. What can you give to your spouse? Think of something that you can give 
and don't hold that back. Give to your spouse and be a person who is generous. Do not withhold, do not withhold the good that God has put into your life that you can put into the life of others. And so again, I say it in just the way that Jesus did here. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Not do this, not, not with any sort of manipulation, but just for its own sake. Now, two more, and I'll go through these last two very quickly. One way that you can do that, that you can give to them what they need and that you can be a person who puts their needs first is to believe in their goodwill. Believe in the goodwill of your spouse. If two Christians are married to one another, I firmly believe that neither one of them intends to do evil toward the other. Now, there may be rare exceptions. There may be outliers on that bell curve, and I understand that, but the outliers do not define the rest of, uh, of the, the average there. They don't define everything else. And so believe good things about another Christian. Listen, you would do that at church, right? The people that you go to church with, you believe the best about them, don't you? Well, if you don't, you should start, but that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> You should believe the best about them. And if you would do that at church, then you ought to do the same at home. I'm talking especially to people that are married to Christians. And, and, and I'm saying to you that if that's the case for you, don't assume that they mean actual harm to you. Believe that they mean well in some way. Even if they are misguided, even if you can't see it, believe the best about them. Above all, the Apostle Peter says, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That passage would be great for us to include in our year's theme on unity and action. I'm talking about our relationships to each other. But again, how much more can we apply the same principle in the relationship that we have with our spouse? Assume the best. At the very least, ask about motives before you assume somebody's motives. And then this last one here, this last one, believe in God's blessings. When I say that, what I mean is the same thing that I said in the Family Report article. If you've taken the time to read that on the front page there, believe that God does and that God will bless you for your pursuit of righteousness in your marriage. This is one of those things that God always does. And I know you're about to start packing up because I know you're out of material on that family report, but hang with me for just a second. This is one of those things that God always does. When he, when he gives direction for a particular realm of life and his directions are followed in that realm of life, God always blesses that realm of life. That was true in the Garden of Eden, right? God said, let there be, let there be, let there be. And all the, all the universe obeyed his voice and these things came into existence and the garden was there and it was beautiful and it was perfect and it was thriving because everything there obeyed God. And he blessed for that and he gave blessings for that obedience. The same was true during the time of David and Solomon when the people of God were, were largely more obedient to God's will than they really had ever been before that. What happened to the nation? Well, he fulfilled all those promises that he made back in the old law that if you do well, if you seek me, I will bless you. Now, you don't seek the blessings that I will give. You seek me and the blessings will come. But if you seek me, you will be blessed. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, that if we turn that principle, if we turn the light of that principle onto our marriages and we view them through that light, that we can be assured that God will bless us in our marriages. And so the principle from Hebrews chapter 11 applies there as well, that whoever would draw near to God, whether in your marriage, with your finances, in your church life, whatever, if you would draw near to God, you must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And I believe that God will bless your marriage with good if you seek him in it. Now, is that what you were expecting out of a sermon on marriage? I really don't know. But I hope that some element of it is helpful in getting your mind calibrated correctly towards your spouse and toward the overall picture of what marriage is in the Bible. We're not trying to get out of the maze. We're not even trying to finish it and get out of it. We're living in this now. That's how it goes. And so what we're trying to do is live well inside the marriage. And so hopefully some of these principles will help 
with that. If you're still holding that family report, and if you've looked at page three, you can tell what we're going to continue this discussion with this evening. And we're going to take a little bit deeper look at some of the struggles that I think can come, not all necessarily, but, all, but some of the struggles that can come with married life. And so tonight I want to ask four questions and offer some responses to those. What if my spouse and I aren't really friends? What if things are just getting worse? What if one of us broke the other's trust? And then what if we're just going through the motions? If that's a message that you think will be helpful to you, I hope you'll be here at five this afternoon because, because it's a shame, really, for something that God intended to be so good for us to turn into something that is so difficult to live with. And if we can help you in any way to make that a better thing, to make it more like what God wants it to be, then we would like to do that. Marriage is talked about as a parallel to the relationship between Jesus and his saints, and so it makes an easy segue for us to make an invitation here at the end of this message. If you would like to become a Christian and be part of the bride of Christ, his church, then we'd like to welcome you into that group on his behalf. And if you want to talk to me or to one of the shepherds about what that looks like, then you can find us up here at the front. You can find us afterwards since you'll know who we are. But in either case, what we'll do is open the word of God and show you his plan for bringing you to himself. And so if you want to make that known in a public way, then why don't you come forward and talk to us while we're all standing and singing this hymn together.